much. Do I refer to you, Hans, or, or uh, Mr. Carell? Or? No, you, you, well, I mean, it's the American style. That's right. <laughs> 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 uh, and Tox. <talks. laughs> so, yeah, Tox and Mikhail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, being fellow Swedish, I've read so much about you from afar in Jamestown, New York, mm -hmm. and when the various articles about you and your career in the United mm -hmm. Nations, and mm -hmm. of course your connection with Kofi Annan, of course, yeah. Kofi Annan's wife being Swedish. Yeah, Swedish, yes, that's right. Uh, it and her father it was a very, very prominent Swedish judge, mm -hmm. and he was also Marshal of the Realm which means that uh, he was one of the three top figures in the country um, aside the king. So that was very interesting. We belonged to the same club, so I saw him often. And actually, last time I saw him was mid-December 2008. And two weeks later, he was dead. You mentioned a little bit last night that he had, during the war, was he a delegate, a Swedish delegate, to um, in Germany? Was, was, was there? A well, I, I think he had some service uh, that he, he, he performed there, but I'm not familiar with the details there. I more looked at his career as a judge. Right. But certainly, yes, he, he was there. And, uh, but more prominently, he was a judge in Northern Africa, uh, and then he was a judge on the Human Rights Court in Strasbourg. Uh, that's where I met him when I defended Sweden before that court. How did you get into this law business? Was, that your, was your dad part of the legal profession? No, my father was a Lutheran pastor. Ah. And uh, this um, gives reason to some reflections now when I've had the privilege in the UN to work with people from all religions and philosophies. And uh, that's why when I left the United Nations, I took as a point of departure Matthew 7, 3, about a man who cannot see the beam in his own eyes, but the moat in his neighbor's eye. And I challenged the whole legal department. Isn't this in your scriptures and so on? I eight quotes from the Quran, from the Talmud, you name it. <laughs> and I mean, the, 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 there are these common features of the religions. And that's why I ended by saying, why don't we keep this to our personal sphere and then agree to live by the rules that we have agreed upon respecting the religions, namely international law? But your question, well, I mean, law, I thought, uh, I didn't want to go into the priesthood, no, so I, I decided to go for law. But to be frank, I wasn't really all that interested when I studied law. Uh, I thought it was rather boring, to mm -hmm. tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, so I played music, and I, I went to sea. I'm a sailor. I've been at sea for one year in four summers. And uh, I actually, uh, in 58, I visited South America, even Talcahuano, where the earthquake just took place. Now we are now in March uh, 2010. And my first visit to the United Nations, uh, to the um, uh, United States, and uh, New York and the United Nations was in 1960. I still have the tickets to Capitol Hill back home. So uh, I, I, you know, there were no backpacks in those days, so <laughs> you had to get around in some way. But then um, <coughs> when I visited New York, I visited also the United Nations. Mm -hmm. And of course, Doug Hammarskjöld right. was then the Secretary General. And I visited his, his meditation room. And I really, I sat there and wondered about this man and the little shaft of light that struck on the stone. All confessions wow. should be comfortable there. Little did I know that 12 months later, I would be a marshal at Uppsala Cathedral at his funeral. And even less did I know that I would end up spending 10 years in the building as legal counsel. What, what does he mean to you? Well, he's a very interesting personality. And um, of course, when his markings came out, or way marks, maybe you should call them, they came out, uh, my father gave them to me. So I read them uh, with admiration. But yet, I was a young man. So I don't think I fully understood the message everywhere. But then I came back and, and, and reread them again, of course, time and again. And when I had new stuff, in my office in the United Nations, I greeted them with my favorite quote from the Waymarks. Openness to life gives a swift insight, like a flash of lightning, into the life situation of others. A must to force the problem from its emotional sting into a clearly conceived intellectual form and act accordingly. And that really has been a lodestar. And also, I would say, another lodestar is his speech, his address at Oxford in May 1961 on the role of the international civil servant.
the integrity, and the fact that sometimes you have to make decisions that might offend one state or the other. But this is inevitable if you are to perform objectively and correctly your task as an international civil servant. These have been my alleged doubts. Well, oh, be darn. Mm. Obviously, clearly very, very, uh, and he died just for the, for the record, uh, 1961. One. Yes, at Ndola. Uh, uh, an airplane uh, yeah. accident. Yeah. I mean, there have been many rumors about it, but I have no special information about it. I, I think probably there was a mistake and the plane went down. How does that impact the Swedish community? Well, I think it made a deep impression. And uh, certainly as a student at Uppsala, because Uppsala was his hometown. His father was governor at Uppsala. He lived at the castle, up on Castle Hill. Um, and uh, uh, when the funeral was over in the cathedral, his coffin was brought out, and I never forget the scene. Two razor-sharp lines of blue helmets presenting arms, and then the wagon drawn by horses, and then the most humble guard of honor I've ever seen. Uh, at Uppsala, the students wear white caps, so there were two meandering lines of white caps mm. up towards the castle, and then it turned sharply to the right, and then Bay to the church audience. Well, obviously, he's had one of those guys that's had a great, great impact on you. Yes. You're known for many things, but one of the things that today's purposes is I was one of the founders of the Robert Jackson Center, who was from Jamestown, New York, our area. Mm -hmm and clearly affiliated with the Nuremberg trial, and I'll make sure you get this one, you get down here. Yes. And the Nuremberg trial legacy finds itself really in the first time in the Yugoslavia tribunal, of which, of course, Richard Goldstone was the first prosecutor. Mm. And throughout those tribunals, which we've talked about the last couple of days, your fingerprints are all over that. Well, but it, it is, I mean, coincidence in a sense. I mean, if you are there at a particular point in time, then, then, then I mean, the, the, the post of chief legal officer of the Swedish Ministry of Justice is vacant probably one every tenth year. And when I had served there for nine and a half years, the post of legal counsel of the United Nations was vacant. And that's another uh, maybe every tenth year. So it's so much a coincidence. But the reason I got involved in this was that I was appointed a, a, a war crimes rapporteur together with two colleagues for Croatia and Bosnia-Herzegovina in 1992 by the CSCE, the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, as mm -hmm. it uh, was named then. And we presented the first proposal for the Yugoslav Tribunal Statute. But we presented a draft convention because legally this was the only way in which the countries in Europe could form a court. But that proposal was sent to the United Nations uh, in February, 9th of February, uh, 1993. And then later the same month, the Security Council decided to establish the court. So it was a sort of a different legal basis. But we were aware of this. So when we made our proposal, we said, well, maybe parts of this can be useful also in the exercise where the Security Council is involved. And then I came to the UN uh, as legal counsel in March. Uh, 1994, and one month later, 6th of April, the plane went down in Kigali, and the genocide started. And I remember to this day Budosgali's desperate plea for 3,500 paratroopers that the military experts said would stop the genocide. No state was prepared to, to, to come up with this. Right, right. And then I visited uh, Kigali in November uh, 1994 to at the request of the Security Council and the Secretary General to convince then President Bizimungu, then Vice President Kagame, and uh, the Prime Minister Fagiria Mungu that they should cooperate with the Rwanda Tribunal. Um, they were, actually Rwanda was on the Security Council and they voted no. Yeah. And the reason was that they were upset that the court could not administer the death penalty. This was important to them. So I remember I had a, quite an argument with the, the president. I think both of us forgot that he was a president and I was just an international civil servant. It was really an argument. Today, Rwanda has abolished the death penalty. Yeah. And then came uh, Sierra Leone, uh, which I negotiated with my team and signed the agreement between the UN and Sierra Leone on the 16th of January, 2002. And in the meantime, I'd also been working on Cambodia 
and negotiated with my counterpart, uh, Vice uh, Prime Minister Sokan, uh, an agreement. It was a very lengthy and difficult um, negotiations, mm -hmm. although I had a very good relationship personally with my uh, opposite party. That agreement I signed on the 6th of June 2003. And in the meantime, the Rome conference uh, had uh, happened in the, the summer of 1998. And there I was something which is called the Secretary General's representative. Mm -hmm. and this means that I'm not sort of involved in negotiations among the states, really, but you're responsible for the organization of the whole conference. Uh, so that must uh, be very smooth functioning. And it was, I was told, the most document intensive conference ever over the United Nations. I think about 700 documents were handed in, translated into oh, the okay. other so six languages. So we sent these documents to New York and Geneva, where the translators were working over the night. And then the documents came early, and the technician took care of them in the morning. <laughs> and then when the delegates came, they were all in the pigeonholes, so they could, could start working on them again. Yes. A lot, man. You just, you just provide a lot. Did, since the prosecutors, or at least setting up the tribunal, not only the negotiations that there would be a tribunal, but then there's the actual effectuating the uh, players who are going to be part of that tribunal. Did you get involved in that at all as to at least the process of how they would determine who would be the prosecutors and who? Well, yes, definitely who uh, would be there. We were involved. And, uh, and of course, Richard Goldstone uh, was identified. And the strange thing is that I had actually met him. He had visited Sweden in the early 1990s for completely different reasons. He wanted to study the way our labor court worked. So I was hosting uh, him and, and uh, his colleagues from South Africa then. And then all of a sudden, our paths crossed here in the UN. But his name was already mentioned. So I, I was not involved in that particular process. But then his successor, for example, Louise Arbour, when she was identified, she was one of the candidates that we had shortlisted. And we had also interviewed uh, so we could discuss this with Kofi Annan. And this is how it worked. And then came uh, Carla Del Ponte. But once they were appointed, then it was a purely administrative relationship in the sense of, well, do they have resources and what mm -hmm. are the requirements? But never, ever get involved in their work as prosecutors. That's, that's their work. And it's very important that nobody else is med meddling into that. I, I was very strict about that. What was the process? I mean, like Goldstone and then Carlo Del Ponte and Louise Arbor. Yeah. I guess I missed that. I was, I Louise Arbor first, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. did, did, was, were they vetted by a group within the secretariat? Well, they were interviewed by me and my deputy and, and among candidates. But the, 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 of course, states advanced their candidates and so sure. forth. So we were looking at it. And what we were looking for was, was competence. And, and he, I'm very concerned about this. And I can tell you. Uh, the Rome Statute on the qualification, for example, of judges, that provision is very different from the one that I and my colleagues had, had prepared in our draft for the Yugoslav Tribunal. I took it for granted that to be appointed a judge on an important international criminal court, you should have demonstrated for quite some time a demonstrated ability to handle effectively and correctly complex criminal cases at the trial level. If you would be appointed to the appeals chamber, then you would have to have demonstrated the same ability, but at that level. Mm -hmm. And usually judges at that level have also experience of having served at the trial level. No transfer, transfer between the two, uh, two levels. And now I experience here that the International Criminal Court, their judges have been moved from the trial chamber to the appeals chamber. That is so irresponsible. I mean, such a small court, a professional judge would know immediately that if you move a judge from the trial chamber to the appeals chamber, that judge would probably be disqualified in, in most cases because he's already adjudicated at the trial level. So that's one of the things that I'm concerned about. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. What's Robert Jackson mean to you? As you, as you, you're, you're part of a sequence, a continuum of Nuremberg, and again, part of Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, and so on. Uh, what's that, the Jackson legacy, if any, mean to, to Hans Krell? Remember, 
that the record upon which we judge these defendants is the same record upon which posterity will judge our performance. Those words are etched in my memory from his first pleading towards the end before the court, the tribunal in Nuremberg. I have visited the courtroom in Nuremberg, and I've also, for that matter, visited the courtroom in Tokyo uh, during a visit there. Um, I can tell you frankly, if you just ask the young judge, Hans Corell, back in the 1960s, what I thought about international courts, I would have been very hesitant. This is extremely complex. There will be a lot of political uh, reverberation around this and so forth. So I was rather, shall we say, hesitant. I changed my mind when I was a war crimes rapporteur for former Yugoslavia. And I saw these devastated people, the old woman with her eyes just empty, pulling and car charged with some meaningless things on, on the roadside outside Vukovar. Who did this to her? And I realized, you are the war crimes rapporteur. So we went back and almost wrote in a fury a proposal that you should appoint a group of lawyers to draft the statute. Now, they didn't do that, and then we offered to do it, which they uh, accepted. And then, when I got involved in this way, I started going back, of course, to Nuremberg. And uh, I knew, of course, Robert Jackson, that I um, started looking closer at it. And then I read uh, the, ana uh, the anatomy of the Nuremberg Tribunal by, uh, ah, uh, Telford Taylor. Telford Taylor, yeah. sorry. I, I remember. Yes, I, I read that with, with great interest also. So to me, uh, this came to mean a lot, and, and especially these words, because it's been a lot of talk about victor's justice, and, and in a sense it was. But when I discussed this, I said, well, how about the trials as they were effected? Because the judges and the prosecutor, they had to operate under the rules that were given. But then, the performance, I think, uh, we have to say that the trials were, 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 were fair. Of course, the death penalty, uh, that I have very strong views about, as you understand oh, from yeah. my discussions yeah. in Rwanda. But I can tell you, I was also asked, after I had retired from the United Nations, to participate in the education of the judges of the special court for, um, uh, for Iraq. And I was very hesitant, and actually people in Sweden, the media, when they heard I would participate in this exercise, they said, well, Hans Corell is educating judges who can administer the death penalty. But I mean, if I would use that measure, I would stop educating American judges who visit The Hague. Uh, there is a special institute that takes them to The Hague, yeah. and I always come there to give sort of an umbrella lecture on international law for them. Uh, and these judges can administer the death penalty. What I can do is, of course, to express my very firm opinion mm -hmm. about the death penalty. But coming back to the Iraq Special Court, they, of course, could administer the death penalty. But I said, if I, if I don't do this, well, I think that's wrong. It's better to engage with them. And I did. And we had working groups, and they had moot trials, not of Saddam Hussein. That, we, that wouldn't have been appropriate. But we had moot cases. And they were performing, and we were discussing the teachers. And when I left uh, from them, I gave them the quote from Robert Jackson that I actually quoted. And I had it translated into Arabic. And I told them, look, you have to be absolutely independent. You must not allow anyone to influence you. It's extremely important. And the first judge, Riz Garamin, who was presiding, he was actually a member of my working group. We had breakout groups. And he resigned from the court. I hope I meet him one day that he can explain why he resigned. Does the name Judge Raid Juhai mean anything to you? He was an investigative, he was a chief investigative law judge at the Iraqi tribunal. He, he turned the process over once Hussein was indicted. Uh huh. Uh, I don't know if that. I, that name doesn't ring a bell. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe, yeah. Because the one, cause there were several judges. There were some 30 people at that course where I uh, organized by the International Bar Association. Um, so I don't remember all the names, but I, I particularly remember Judge Rizkar Amin because of the fact that he was in my working group. I say that only because Judge Raid is currently in the United States and he'll be at the Jackson Center next week. Ah, I see. Small world. Well, maybe uh, when I see him, maybe uh, <laughs> I will recognize his face, uh, not the name. Uh, exactly. Politics. How much does the politics of the determination of the prosecutor play out? You, you obviously had a chance to 
receive applications from the member states who advance certain names as chief prosecutors. You had the chance then to vet it mm -hmm. and interview those. Uh, was there much of that lobbying, obvious? I, I really can't say that there was. Uh, I mean, the difficulty here is to find truly competent people who can, who can perform. And uh, yes, there, were, there was a short list, but once we had ident identified the, the persons here, uh, I don't think there was any particular partic uh, political uh, maneuvering here. Maybe it's more when, when you appoint judges uh, mm -hmm. that's more sensitive. Um, and of course it's unavoidable, but I hope that we can find a method. And I'm actually engaged now since I'm free to, to do <laughs> work uh, as I please. I'm retired from public service, so maybe I should say this for the record that I'm an ambassador, but, but I'm retired from public service uh, and I've been retired uh, for six years. So I'm very much engaged in, in different uh, matters, including uh, with Kofi Annan in Kenya, for example. But, but uh, we actually are considering whether we should set up some kind of uh, non-governmental uh, machinery where we will start vetting the candidates and if we discover that states propose candidates that are not competent I mean there's even been a case where a person appointed to an international criminal court wasn't even a lawyer I mean, you wonder yeah. what this is all about so uh, it, because if we start pronouncing ourselves uh, with the uh, shall we say the, the, the our own uh, record as probably see a, a guarantee of credibility. I think states will think twice before they uh, propose candidates that are not uh, competent. I mean, we have no political uh, aspects. I, I, I don't have no, I, no opinion whatsoever from which country uh, the, the judges would come. All I'm looking for is a competent and objective judge who does not sort of, s s and in it, for me, in my country, Sweden, we have perhaps a different system from other countries or many other countries. You go directly from law school to a circuit court where you become a clerk for the senior judges. Six months later, you are on the bench in your own capacity for very simple cases, of course. But this is the way we are trained. So I was 24 years when I was on the bench. And the senior judge said, look, this is your first court day. Nobody can tell you how you should adjudicate. You are on your own now with the late, we had late judges also uh, that you consulted with, right. that's the system. And then gradually you were given more, more and more responsibility. So, I mean, when I was uh, a little past 30, I was sitting not on murder cases, and, but, but arson and fairly, fairly grave cases. And you sort of grew into that, that role uh, with, the, with the confidence. And suddenly you can make mistakes, but then that is tested if people appeal your judgments. And then if the Court of Appeal would confirm the judgment, then, when the, then you have done a good job if they change it. Well, that happens also to senior judges that their judgments are concerned. So this experience I had with me all the time, and that was a, uh, shall we say, science, I wasn't all that impressed when people came staring at me. I have instructions for my capital and so forth. I'm listening to everybody, but I make my own judgment. Mm -hmm. And, and um, of course, what I never forget is the seriousness and the, shall we say, detail with which the senior judges went about their daily work. Mm -hmm. That was something I, I saw and, and, and I learned from that. So, uh, to me, uh, uh, it was really, you, you were trained to, to become a judge. This may be more uh, uh, just a general question. The Secretary General, how much attention did they normally pay to what was going on in the tribunals? Okay, once they were set up, once the pros chief prosecutor was appointed, uh, kind of the ongoing activities of Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, was there a did you guys talk about it much? Well, um, certainly we, we did discuss it, but you have to realize, and this applies also to me, sure. you had the whole world. Sure. You never knew in the morning what would happen. I mean, there could be an incident with a staff member where you had to, to deal with somewhere in the secretary to somewhere in the world. It could be a plane down in Angola 
self-deterrent missile. I mean, you, you had to sort of go uh, all over, over these things. The law of the sea, I was deeply involved in, in these matters, setting up uh, the three institutions, the law of the sea tribunal, uh, the seabed authority and the continental shelf commission, all these kinds of things. So you had to concentrate on the issues on your table. The Iraq, I mean, how much time didn't that take? But in between, we were always following this. But at the same time, the courts are independent. And the only things that really could sort of mean that the Secretary General had to be kept uh, informed was if somebody at a very high level was to be indicted. And I remember when Milosevic uh, uh, was indicted, Louise Arbor, we happened to be in Stockholm, Kofi Annan and I, uh, at some, on some event. She came to Stockholm to inform him the day before she uh, indicted him that she was going to do that because she understood that that might be something that the Secretary General would be, uh, have to be aware of. Not asking uh, in any way permission, but as a courtesy said, this is what I'm doing. And I mean, the prosecutor has to follow the evidence. Look at Sudan, for example, where the Security Council has asked the ICC to look at the situation in Sudan. And the prosecutor follows the evidence, and all of a sudden, he thinks that he has to indict the head of state. What happens to the Security Council? Just crumbles. Yeah. Where I had expected the council to be firm, and said, well, this is what we intended. And of course, it is at this level that the highest responsibility rests. Certainly, anyone indicted, in particular in this case, the head of state of Sudan, is entitled to the presumption of innocence. But the council should be consequent. And I think this is a rule of life. If you enter on a path, then you have to be prepared to take the consequences. And here I'm deeply disappointed in the Security Council. And actually, coming back to your question, yes, certainly, um, and mostly I dealt with Kofi Annan here because I worked for three years for Bhutas Ghali, but then they had only started. But Kofi Annan was not a lawyer. He was an administrator. Um, but he was extremely um, concerned to, to look at the legal aspects. And often I heard there was a special signal on the telephone. And then my secretary wouldn't answer. This was a direct line from the Secretary General. So then you have to answer yourself. And then I heard Hans, and then he had a question. Have you seen this? I have a paper here. I don't see that the legal office has approved of this. Otherwise, it came back down that we looked at it again. So it was interesting to see how, how very careful he was to, to strictly observe the law here. Charles Taylor. when. David Crane decided to unseal the indictment and, 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 and serve it. Were you, what was the reaction in the secretariat at that time? Because I think that was one of the, <coughs> I'm trying to think of the earlier times where a president had. Yeah. Been. Well, I haven't discussed it with, with David really, but uh, I mean, he, the indictment of Charles Taylor, by the way, if I had known when I signed the agreement with Solomon Bereva, on the 60th of January 2002 that Charles Taylor would be uh, uh, prosecuted, I would have shook my head and said, I don't believe you, and yet there it is. The question of serving the indictment when it was in Ghana, that's a more complex matter. And I thought for myself, what if this had happened in Sweden? Would we have the legal authority to arrest this person? And I very much doubt we had, because I had hoped when I negotiated the agreement with Sierra Leone, that the Security Council would step in and say, we take note of this agreement and we order all states to cooperate with the tribunal. Had they done that, then we had had the Yugoslavia-Rwanda situation from a legal point of view. Then he could have been arrested. But, but I don't think that Ghana really had the legal means of arresting him. And against that background, one can always ask the question whether it was uh, a, 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 a correct way of, of dealing with it. But, um, I mean, that's history, and I don't want to pass judgment. But I remember that my immediate reaction was, if this had happened in my country, we would have probably been very embarrassed, because we, we wouldn't have had the legal means of, of, of arresting you, Did you know it was coming? Did they give you a heads no. up? No. no. No, that would have been inappropriate. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, whether the Secretary General knew, I, I don't know. I was not uh, aware of this. Mm -hmm. what, was, what was the reaction of, of that? Was there? 
Well, I, I, I really don't remember the details now. I, I want to remember my own sort of more legal yeah, right. uh, chewing over this. Yeah. What, 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 what can they do in Ghana, and what could I have done if I'd been in a in responsible uh, uh, back in my my responsibility in Sweden? Yeah. How could I have acted? Because yeah. I guess I'm trying to think of Milosevic. He was in custody at the time, wasn't he? Was he when the indictment was served on him? Uh, no, no. I, I think that that he was not. Uh, he was not. This was. Um, I, I really don't remember exactly the details because there have been so many issues. So I have to be careful since I'm <laughs> I'm <laughs> being interviewed here. Yeah, I, I want to be precise sure. uh, when I uh, express my. But I uh, because if he had been arrested, then what would have been the big news? I mean, the, the news was that there was an indictment uh, to be served, and so he was transferred later. And of course, uh, what I'm very sad about is that uh, Radko Mladic is still at large, and, and I'm really very puzzled. How, how, how should we believe that the mightiest nations in the world, on the Security Council, the P5, for example, that they can't ferret out a person and I remember that when we drafted our proposal for the statute of the Yugoslav Tribunal, we said to ourselves that once indicted, these people sooner or later become a burden to their country. Well, it was interesting. You're, you asked the question directly yesterday of Serge Bramertz. He didn't quite answer the question uh, as to the knowledge. I, I, I get the sense from other car conversations I've had with him that they certainly kind of know where he is. It's just a matter of the... Uh, uh, political will yeah. to make that yeah. happen. Uh, as you reflect, being, again, being involved in the beginnings of various tribunals which have uh, gone from uh, the treaty tribunals to the hybrid tribunals, and uh, what's the legacy when, when the funding finally runs out, the mission finally of those tribunals mm -hmm. comes to closure? Uh, and if you had to look at a crystal ball in 2014, 2015, what's the lesson we will have learned through this experience? Mm. Let me first say that I never myself use the concept uh, hybrid courts. I prefer calling them mixed courts. One of the reasons being that I'm an amateur ornithologist. And a hybrid is not a very pretty thing there. Usually they are very ugly and also they are not fertile. So um, I, I think one should be careful here. <laughs> But uh, so to answer your question, um, let me say this. Many people say, what's the use? And it's extremely expensive. And why should we invest so much money in all this? So my answer is, I see this as an investment for the future. And I think it's extremely important that we work to establish a solid international criminal justice system as the last resort because the complementarity must always be there. We'd have to deal with this at the national level. But as with human beings, states, some states will always fall out of the framework. And um, there you have to realize that if we then cannot master the situation by uh, using an international criminal court, then we are back in the society we had before we started this. And just imagine taking away the criminal justice system at the national level, how many days do you think it would take before the strong man who sees that a vacuum here would take over and we will have anarchy? This is a lesson that the human society has learned over centuries. Ubi civitas, ubi ibi jus, where in the society there is also a legal order. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily that we would have agreed with the legal orders over the centuries, but, but still every legal order is a reflection of its uh, uh, contemporary society. So for me, I think the legacy will be that this is how it all began. My hope is that the ICC can manifest its position, but my hope is even greater that states, one after the other, will join the family of democracies, will establish at the national level a court system that is stable enough and competent enough to deal with these crimes so that you could do that at the national level. And I think that if states ratify the Rome Statute, or other conventions in this field, then by necessity they would have to see to it that the national legislation um, uh, reflects uh, and, and that they can answer up to that. But, and, and, but then let me come to what has become my mantra uh, in later years. When I look at the rear mirror, 
look at my years, years, 10 years in the courts, my 13 years in the Ministry of Justice, my nine years in the Foreign Office in Stockholm, and my 10 years in the UN. And now, when I'm free to speak my mind in a, in a different way, as it were, uh, than when you were in the UN, because there you have certain rules that you have to observe. I've become more and more critical of the member states of the United Nations. Many criticize the UN, uh, its um, bureaucratic and overpaid bureaucrats. I can tell you, if I just look at my own office with some 170 people, I would take that office and challenge any major competent law firm in the US with that office. I had very, very good people, and many worked extremely hard. And some of the staff of the United Nations, they, they fall in the line of duty. Sergio Viadimello in August 2003 with 21 others was gone. And the earthquake in Haiti, who was head of the UN mission? Hedi Anavi, mm -hmm. a friend. We were sitting at the table with the Secretary General discussing these things. He's now gone. This, this is the UN for me. Certainly there are those who fall out of the framework, but, but in any organization you would find the odd ones out. But what about reforming the organization? I gave a lecture in San Diego three years ago, and the title of that lecture is Who Needs Reforming the Most? The United Nations or its members? I think you can guess the answer. Sure. And in particular, I'm homing in now on the Security Council and the permanent five members. They hold the key to a peace and security in the world. But then they have to bow to the law and they have to apply the same measure. Why ask the International Criminal Court to address the situation in the Sudan and not doing the same in the Middle East? The Middle East is really a shame. I was nine years old in the schoolyard when a friend came running and said, Hans, Hans, have you heard they have killed Count Bernadot, Volker Bernadot, of the Swedish royal family, the first UN peacemonger in the Middle East. It was in 1948. And it's been going on and on and on and on since then. Now, I'm not putting uh, the blame on, on just one side here. I think, for example, if you look at uh, Richard Goldstone's report uh, and uh, events in Gaza, I said already in January, uh, 2009 at a manifestation for peace in the Middle East, I said re already then the ICC should look at the situation because accusations are uh, crossing the, the, the borders here. The Hamas is of course a crystal clear case, sending rockets from one territory into another territory f with the purpose of, of killing civilians or maiming civilians. That's a terrorist act, crystal clear. Right. The Israeli behavior is more complex, but here the Goldstone report is very, very disturbing reading. He has not made a criminal investigation. He's been very clear about that. But why not ask a prosecutor to look at that situation? That's the only way in which you can get a correct answer to what happened. And this is where I see the weakness of the system. And if you ask me then, where is the blame to be put? I put the main blame on the Western states because we had, in the past century, two world wars. The lessons from those world wars was, in the first world war, you humiliated the defeated. And that created an atmosphere that paved the way for a little man with a mustache, mm -hmm. Adolf Hitler. And then you know what happened. The second world war, they were smarter. Franklin D. Roosevelt coming back from Yolta before Congress on the 1st of March, 1945. Peace is not the work of one man, or one society, or one country. It is an effort in which the whole world has to engage. He died on the 12th of April, 1945. Mm -hmm. Four days later, Truman stands before the same Congress and talking about the great nations, meaning the victorious nations. The duty, he said, of the great nations today is to serve, not to dominate. Where has this wisdom gone? Mm -hmm. The UN Charter was negotiated in San Francisco, including with the bipartisan delegation on the UN side, remembering the, uh, uh, the lesson from the, uh, uh, the uh, League of Nations. And I think it was adopted by 
Congress, sorry, by the Senate by 98 votes in favor. I forget if the two abstained or they were absent. I, I don't remember that. This was a creation of the United States of America. Can you imagine the United Nations with 100% support of the US? Instead, in particularly in later years, and in particular during the Bush administration, the UN was belittled. And look at the attack on Iraq. In a book on Colin Powell, who I felt for a very, very sympathetic person. He, he was a soldier, but he was also a humanist than, that you discover when you, when you listen to them and you see them interacting with the Secretary General. I think it's a, a young woman, or young, he's written a book called Soldier. I think on page four, five, six in that book, there is a following quote, that, that Powell tried to garner support for the resolution authorizing an attack on Iraq. But he said he knew that to the White House, the UN was just a sideshow to be endured for a period of time and then cast aside when the real action started. I may not be 100% exact in the right. quote, but this is the gist of it. And, and this is how I felt. And my heart sank, of course, when the attack occurred. Because, and now when they discuss attacking Iran, but not a whisper in the American debate about an attack on Iran would be a flagrant violation of the UN Charter. Mm -hmm. There are only two situations where you're allowed to attack. In clear self-defense, if an attack occurs or is imminent, this is not the case. Mm -hmm. Or after a clear mandate by the Security Council. And I don't think that is forthcoming unless they ask for, yeah. for it. So I think this is very serious that the engineer behind the UN Charter is actually violating the Charter. That sends a signal around the world that, that rule of law, well, that's when, when it suits your interest. Yeah. Now, I have written a letter <coughs> to the members of the United Nations on the 10th of December, the day the Universal Declaration was adopted, the 10th of December 2008, because they are discussing enlarging the Council. Mm -hmm. And the title of that letter is Security Council Reform, Rule of Law More Important Than Additional Members. Because the Council is an executive body. 15 members is already a high number. Ask any director from the private sector how c big can a board become sure. before it becomes ineffective. 26 members is the highest bid. If they go for that, they have basically destroyed the UN as a competent peace organization. Therefore, I instead suggested that the permanent five should sit down, look at each other, and say, what on earth are we doing? We are behaving in a manner that we are actually creating conflicts. So I've suggested they do four things. Number one, from now on, declaration by them, binding under international law. From now on, we promise to bow to the law, and in particular, to the very law we are set to supervise, the UN Charter. Number two, we are not going to use our veto unless our innermost direct national interests are at issue. Does the Middle East, Burma, Sudan, and Zimbabwe qualify for that? No. Third, we are not going to use force except when the UN Charter authorizes that, self-defense or after a clear and unambig unambiguous um, uh, uh, mandate by the Security Council. And fourth, we will engage in the responsibility to protect when this is necessary, and we will be transparent in our assessment. assessment. And this is what we are discussing at this conference, because of crimes against humanity. I mean, for example, Rwanda, nobody was prepared to send in soldiers to stop the situation. Right. This is, in a sense, how I see <coughs> the situation when I look in the, in the rear mirror and when I look ahead. And I combine your question here on the courts also with some other elements. I'm now deeply engaged in work on the Arctic. I don't think many people realize the size of the polar regions. The Antarctica is a continent of 14 million square kilometers surrounded by sea. The Arctic is the opposite. It is an ocean of 14 million square kilometers surrounded by continents. 
Now, Antarctica, there's a special treaty regime that works well. We don't have to look at that, but the Arctic is different. And here, the ices are melting, the sea lanes are opening up, and so on. And then you have this relationship between Moscow and Washington that is not as good as it ought to be. Mm -hmm. And here, I've actually suggested in an address I gave in Nashville in February last year under the title, The Arctic, an opportunity to cooperate and demonstrate statesmanship, that Moscow and Washington should sit down with the other six Arctic states and discuss the situation. Now, many don't realize how much is 14 million square kilometers. But if I tell you that this is one and a half times the size of the United States of America, then you have yeah. a different perspective. And what I cannot forgive, the Western states in particular, is that when the Berlin Wall came down, they had forgotten the lessons from the First and the Second World War. The Second World War, where Marshall and others, you create a partner of the defeated. That was a lesson from the Second World War. When the Berlin Wall came down, why did not the Western states, and in particular the US, engage the Russians in a profound discussion on one very important topic? We have one interest in common, a very important interest where we should be able to agree we must not get into an armed conflict with each other. What are your concerns? These are our thoughts. Yeah. Well, there were some attempts, but not really uh, rather lukewarm. And soon, in particular, the US started going it alone. And then starting building rocket ramps in Poland and the Czech Republic, as if, as if the Cuban crisis is completely forgotten. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling. And this country, with all these brain institutions and, and think tanks, uh, we are sitting at Brookings, uh, one of them here now. I mean, with all these brains, and an administration can sort of get into this. And uh, uh, this is, uh, in a sense, what I'm, what I'm looking for is statesmanship. And uh, I had the privilege of working with two organizations that organize former heads of state and government, the Madrid Club, where uh, I was chairman of the, one of the working groups that prepared them for the uh, Madrid Agenda Against Terrorism, mm -hmm. adopted on the 11th of March 2005, one year after the terrorist attack in Madrid. And then there's another organization based in Tokyo, the Interaction Council. And they adopted a communique uh, in 2008 where they really read the riot act here and said that the only way ahead is a multilateral rules-based system. And then they go on and, and say to their uh, colleagues now in office that the, that, that the great nations, the great states should understand that this, this they have to take the lead. Yeah. And it is actually in their interest to, to bow to the law because then they can avoid conflicts that then they, they have to handle. So this, uh, this is what I'm looking for, the, the statesmanship. I come back to my experience from the sea. I mean, you don't steer the ship by looking in the water in front of the bell. You look for the stars and the horizon, the eye marks, and you have to have a kind of vision of where you are heading and, and also engage those who are, those who are maybe your, 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 your uh, even enemies or where you have controversies. With them, it's all the more important to engage. And in particularly Iran, it's so sad to see this great nation with a culture, a history far going way back, if you compare to my own country, Sweden, or the United States of America, for that matter. And um, there is a Persian poet, Omar Khayyam, who has written poems uh, under the title Rubaiyat. Mm -hmm. And one of them, four lines, he likens the world with an old caravanserai. And he says, this battered caravanserai, whose portals are alternate night and day, where sultan after sultan with his pomp abode his destined hour and went his way. Mm -hmm. And if I look at the world, is this what is happening now? We are having these sultans who have embattled the globe. We have to be very careful here. We have the climate change, rising sea levels, the world population, 
8.7 billion people today, predictions for 2050, 9.2, 40% more people in 40 years. You have the rising sea levels. I don't know whether this come true, but when I chaired a conference in Ilulisat in September 2008 in Greenland, I saw the towering ice charging down into the sea 50 meters per day in the summer. And Greenland is plus seven meters. That won't happen overnight. But only plus one meter will make Bangladesh 60% inhabitable. Only Dhaka has 18 million inhabitants. Where are they going to go? And will they be welcome where they come? These are the real threats to international peace and security. And that's why statesmanship requires that the P5 in the Security Council puts an end to the Middle East, the generals in Burma, Sudan, and so they have really to, and if they put down the foot, they would send a signal around the globe that would make the globe reverberate to all potential warlords and dictators that from now on, they are coming after us. And I know that China and, and the US have different interests, certainly. What I am looking at is China from the perspective that there are 300 million Americans there are 300 million Chinese, but there is another billion Chinese. It is still a dictatorship, and I've had long discussions with their ambassadors to the UN, and asking the question, don't you think that your country, the government in your country, must pass the same threshold as the government in the Western world, namely, they have to meet their people in an election. Now, in Europe, we couldn't always do this without there being a revolution. Yeah. And you had your own problems in your own country. Will the Chinese be able to move, make this move, without there being internal strife? Because if, if there's internal strife in China, I'm afraid we, we would be able to read it on the seismographs around the world. Yeah. You've had an incredible career and touched so many <coughs> spots in the international landscape. If you had to do it over again, are there, were there, are there any disappointments, any things you would have tried to do differently? That's a very, very difficult question. This means that you have started dissecting things you have done and so on. Maybe, but I really try to look forward mm -hmm. all the time and of course, learning from mistakes you've made and, uh, and learning from others. Uh, for example, listening uh, when I was invited to this meeting of the former heads of state and government, the most senior being Helmut Schmidt, 90 years old, but still a mind sharp as, as ever. Um, to listen to them uh, and also th the way they rather humbly uh, looked back uh, at what I have done, I think perhaps a little more humility and a sense of, of responsibility. Um, I think there are many around the world who are, since I'm now in the US, looking at uh, President Obama, hoping that he will be able to, to make a change. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also perhaps repair the reputation of the US. I mean, a, a democracy and a state under the rule of law that can engage in things such as happen in, in Iraq, the attack, the uh, torture, uh, the, the, the uh, Guantanamo and so forth, that, that's so sad. I, you would have to understand, I came here 50 years ago for the third time and, and I always looked at the US as the friend who came and pulled us out of the mud in Europe when we had really messed it up for us. And by the way, Sweden was a neutral country and many people would say, well, you, you have no experiences of the war. My grandfather, I never met him. He was torpedoed, pit, torpedoed by a German submarine on the 13th of June, 1918. He was the first officer on a merchant ship. Mm. So my grandmother brought up her two daughters and my uncle, who was born five months after his father was dead, she brought those three children up on her own. Mm. And um, this, this is why, if you ask, uh, what I would be doing in another way. Maybe I would have worked more 
intensely to strengthen the standing of the women in society. Because I think if you hear the combination, I mean, of climate, population growth, and so forth, there women have a very important role to play. There's a direct correlation between the level of development in a country and the standing of the women. And also, if women were allowed to participate in decision making and participate and decide about her own body, how many children she would have, then maybe we could deal also with the population growth in the world. And, and um, so, so that's one of the elements I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of. And then, of course, the fight against corruption, which is a poison that destroys so much uh, in societies. I'm working now with Kofi Annan in Kenya. I'm his legal advisor at the panel of eminent African personalities. And when you get so close to a country and realize how much corruption there is in the country, your, your heart sinks. And the climate, the Copenhagen, President Obama, billions of dollars are to be transferred from the industrialized world to developing countries. I would send a falcon with a sharp eye to follow that money, that it doesn't end up in the wrong place. And this is yet another thing where I think I would have been more active uh, had I understood this earlier. How come that certain states host banks where dictators tax evaders and robbers hide their money. My very good friend, American friend, Joseph Connor, former uh, CEO of Price Waterhouse, he was head of the UN administration in parallel when I was legal counsel. When we were trying to identify banks to hold the oil for food account for Iraq, we were warned that maybe certain banks held Saddam Hussein's money. How can a managing director of a bank in a civilized country look himself in the mirror knowing that he is hosting the money of a person who behaves the way Saddam Hussein right. did. And I never forget when I met with Saddam Hussein, Kofi Annan went there in February 1998 to negotiate the weapons inspectors into his palaces. And it was a very strange experience to see this man, clad as a European, tie and all, polite, leading a discussion with the Secretary General in a manner that any head of state would have done. If you hadn't known who he was, you wouldn't have understood. Yeah. So that was a very, very eerie experience. So again, coming back to this, um, uh, the oil for food. Mm -hmm. Why not? I negotiated the agreement, the memorandum of understanding. And here all kinds of stories have been told. Kofi Annan invented the oil for food program. He did not. It was the Security Council that decided the Saloon 986 to set up this program. And I negotiated the memorandum that executed the system. I don't think the council realized the complexity mm -hmm. of that operation. Furthermore, the council did not give the secretariat 100% control of the program. They maintain the authority to review the contracts and so forth. So we were asked to do a very, very difficult thing. But when I signed the agreement with Ambassador Alambari on the 20th of, of, of May, in 1996, there was almost euphoria in the organization. Now people will have food in Iraq and so forth. And then, of course, we had to identify and set up the banks and set the, everything up. Then, as you know, UN was accused of corruption. The truth here is that, yes, there were three uh, officers who were suspected of having taken bribes. And so I think two were convicted and one is still not uh, being tried up by a court. But of course, I'm extremely upset because that gave the platform for those who criticized the UN to stand there screaming at us. The truth of the matter is that for seven years, this program fed 25 million people. The turnover was $65 billion. When the program was wound up in 2003, it was wound up, the residue according to the Security Council resolution, was handed over to the United States of America to be held in a fund for the benefit of Iraq. We handed over eight billion, not million, eight billion dollars. Nobody can today in the U.S. 
give a 100% account for where that money went. That's, in my view, the scandal. Or their capitals who played the codes with, with Saddam Hussein and, and paid bribe. The UN Secretary, surely uh, the Secretary could have done better. I was not involved in running the program because, as I said, I, I negotiated and did the agreement, and then you had to, to look for the next thing. The immediate thing after, um, after the oil for food and that was the Lockerbie suspects, where I negotiated and organized and executed the transfer of the two Lockerbie suspects from Tripoli to the Netherlands to be tried by a Scottish mm -hmm. court. Probably the most dangerous operation I've ever conducted. But so you see, the legal counsel is looking at uh, all kinds of things. But I, I wanted to, to say this for the record. And uh, you're welcome to check. There are journalists, I think, uh, from <laughs> Vanity Fair who have been looking into this, where the oil for food money went. So that's, uh, that's uh, as I understand it. Yeah. You're an amazing guy. I really, uh, <laughs> well, he must tell you, I really enjoyed this. And I, I look forward to the time when we can get you to our Swedish community in Jamestown, New York, part of the Jackson Center. I can really see where there would be a wonderful opportunity for that. So we'll continue to stay in touch. But, I've taken up a lot of your time this morning, but boy, it's been just incredible. Yeah, in five minutes I have the steering committee meeting, so <laughs> I was a bit worried <laughs> all of a sudden. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much.